Hello, in this video we'll consider the section 306 preferred stock bailout checklist. So this video, it's very important that you watch the section 305 corporate stock distribution checklist first because it will make a lot more sense after you go through the section 305 rules with respect to whether a stock distribution will be taxable or not taxable to the shareholders receiving the distribution. It'll make a lot more sense in terms of what's going on here. So before we go through the actual technical mechanics of the law and the application of the law, consider the following example. And this example ties to a similar example that we saw in the corporate stock distribution checklist, the section 305 rules. So we have Fruit Tree Corporation, and Fruit Tree Corporation has 100 shares of common stock outstanding. Now there's only one class of stock, common stock, common stock voting stock, and this or these 100 shares are owned equally by five shareholders. Apple, banana, coconut, dragon fruit, and eggplant, or A, B, C, D, E, whatever makes it easier for you. So therefore, each shareholder owns 20 shares, and each has a 20% interest in the corporation. We get that by simply just taking 20 shares owned by each over the 100 total shares. Remember, there's only one class of stock, so each owns 20%. And that's the before. That's the before percentage. So that's the before percentage. The value of each share is $1,000 per share. So the corporation is owned, since it's 100 share, the corporation's valued at, sorry, not owned. Corporation's valued at, since it's 100 shares, that's going to be 100 shares times $1,000, $100,000 before the stock distribution. Apple has an adjusted basis per share in her 20 shares of common stock of $300 per share. So total, we're talking about a $6,000 basis in all 20 shares. We get that by taking the 300 shares times 20 shares, and that gives us $6,000. $6,000. Now, Fruit Tree Corporation declares a 10% stock distribution of preferred stock. That's the key here. Now, in our previous video, it was of common stock. Now we have preferred stock. So each shareholder gets an additional two shares of preferred stock. So after the stock distribution, each shareholder owns 20 over 100 shares of common stock, and each one owns two over 10 shares of preferred stock. Now, where do I get the two shares? Because I tell you, they each now have two shares of preferred stock. How did I get 10 shares? There's a 10% stock distribution of preferred stock. So we take the 100 shares of common stock before times 10% gives us 10 shares of preferred stock. Preferred stock from the stock distribution total. That's total. Okay. So after the distribution, again, the corporation is 100 shares of common, that's right here, and uh, 10 shares of preferred. So we get the 10 shares of preferred here and the 100 shares of common I just noted as well. Each shareholder owns 20 over the 100 and 2 over the 10 preferred. Okay, 2 over the 10 of preferred stock. So there's no change in terms of ownership. They still, each shareholder still owns 20% of the corporation. Now let's talk about a few things before we go on to the next line. This transaction, or these two paragraphs, okay, before and after, after we have a stock distribution, each shareholder has two new shares, still owns 20% of the corporation. Does the corporation have any tax consequences? No, because in our corporate stock distribution video, as we discussed, all that happens in the stock distribution is under stockholders' equity, the corporation is moving money from paid in capital, I'm sorry, my apologies, retained earnings to paid in capital. But stockholders' equity still is the same before and after. Yes, retained earnings goes down, paid in capital goes up, but it balances out and stockholders' equity stays exactly the same. So the corporation has no gain or loss on this transaction the uh, distribution of the two preferred stock shares because the corporation doesn't change. It still is worth $100,000 before and after. The 100 shares total times $1,000 per share is $100,000. Before, after, corporation still stays the same value. What about the shareholders? Well, the shareholders, because they still own 20% of a corporation worth 
$100,000, their ownership still stays exactly the same and viewed in total. There's no change in net worth or accession to wealth. Net worth stays the same and therefore there's no change with respect to gross income, no gross income here, and therefore no consequences to the shareholder. Now, however, that $6,000 adjusted basis total that we calculated already, right? The three thousand, sorry, $300 per share times the 20 shares, the adjusted basis is $6,000 total. That $6,000 adjusted basis, that is now going to be divided over the 20 common shares and the two preferred shares. To figure out how to calculate that, go back to the stock distribution video um, that we corporate stock distribution video that we've already gone through. And I mentioned at the beginning of this video, you definitely need to look at. That's not where we're focused here, okay? What we are focused on in this video is what happens if Apple tries to sell the two shares of preferred stock that are received three years later to fig a new owner or any owner, even if it was any owner or possibly even a redemption. That's what this checklist focuses on. Well, back in the 30s and 40s, there was a major case named Chamberlain that went to the circuit court level, U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals level, okay? And basically, that's exactly what the shareholder tried to do. There was a stock distribution, and the shareholder tried to sell preferred stock the stock distribution was not taxable under the principles that we've already gone through because net worth did not go up or down, right? It stayed equal and therefore no gross income to the shareholder and no recording as we saw in our previous example, right? No gross income as we saw in our previous example. But when the shareholder sold the preferred stock, the shareholder tried to do our normal section 1001 treatment of amount realized minus adjusted basis, which gave capital gain or capital loss because the character of the stock is capital asset. IRS can, came in and said, no, it's too good to be true because you've only done that to circumvent the dividend rules. The courts though, they agreed with the t taxpayer and said, no, 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 they're selling stock and they have changed around their stock owner ownership. Yes, now they have common and preferred, so that's enough for us. Therefore, the courts ruled in favor of the taxpayer and gave them capital gain, capital loss. So then in 1954, Section 306 was enacted to deal with this situation. What if Apple tries to sell the two shares of preferred stock that were not taxable when received? And this is referred to as a preferred stock bailout. The reason why this is so important is because Let's take 1975 or the 1970s. Let's say in 1975, the highest long-term capital gains rate is 30%, which historically it's around 28 to 30%. The highest ordinary income rate is 80%. If we have a taxpayer in this transaction, Apple, that's subject to an 80% ordinary income tax rate and a 30% long-term capital gains rate, well, Apple wants to get 80%, I'm sorry, does not want to get 80%, wants to get 30%. That's what Apple's trying to do. So rather than the corporation distribute out money, what it would do is distribute out preferred stock. And then later, a few years later, when the preferred stock has been held for more than a year, Apple would then um, sell it for a long-term capital gain and get subject to a 30% tax rate, not an 80% rate, which that avoids 50% in tax. This is known as the preferred stock bailout. So what Congress did was put in Section 306 to basically stop this, to stop this. Again, lots we've seen this a lot and when you look at corporate tax. We saw this with redemption rules. We saw this with various stock, various stock distribution rules and also all over the place. But really, you see with the, the redemption rule, Section 302, where we treat either a redemption where the corporation buys back shares as either a Section 1001 capital gain or loss um, from the sale of stock by the shareholder or a section 301 distribution where if lots of EMP subject to a uh, dividend. So I have a checklist created here that helps you determine if section 306 applies. The first question is, does the taxpayer have section 306 stock? So there's really three major categories when section 306 stock applies, but it really can be um, other situations as well. But these are the big three, the big three situations. We have the first, the second, and the third situation where you can have section 306 stock. The first situation, which is really what we're focusing on here in our examples, because that's what we're dealing with here in the example above with Apple, 
Well, that's where you have a non-taxable stock distribution, pro rata stock distribution that's tax-free under Section 305A, like we saw in the corporate stock distribution checklist. And the corporation has adequate earnings and profits, which you're going to see in our checklist. If they don't, then the idea is that, okay, well, the, the it's not a preferred stock bailout because um, the taxpayers and the corporation aren't trying to avoid the ability for dis- for dividend because it wouldn't have been dividend anyways. It would have been under Section 301, the corporate, I'm sorry, this, the distribution rules. See that checklist. It would have been treated as return of capital and capital gain and treated very similar to what we have here. So there's we're not hiding. We're not fooling anybody. Okay. So again, the first situation is when you have section 305A applies where there is a stock distribution that's not taxable to the shareholder because it's a pro rata stock distribution like we had above of either common stock or preferred stock. Here we had preferred stock. We saw situations in the uh, stock distribution checklist of common stock. And there also has to be adequate earnings and profits. The second situation deals with tax-free reorganizations when you when a preferred stock is received by um, owners in a tax-free reorganization or a Section 355 transaction. We're not going to focus on that here, but that's possible. The third situation is when preferred stock is received that Section 350 in a 351 transaction where the receipt of money um, instead of stock would have been treated as a dividend to any extent. So the idea here is in all three situations, we have preferred stock, preferred stock, preferred stock being received by the shareholders. And later there's going to be some type of transaction that goes on. Again, we're going to focus on the first one here where we have non-taxable stock distribution under section 305A, a pro rata stock distribution on common stock, and there's adequate earnings and profits. So if we have one of these three, we continue. If not, we don't have any section 306 stock, so we don't have to worry about this checklist. But let's say we do which we do above, right? We do have that in our situation because Apple, if Apple later tries selling those two shares of preferred stock, right? Well, those two shares of preferred stock were not taxable under section 305 when received. So now, uh uh-oh, Apple's trying to later sell. We have section 306 stock issues. Okay, number two, is the section 306 stock being disposed of in a complete termination of a shareholder's interest? So the shareholder has no ownership after the um, sale or redemption of the stock, the preferred stock. If yes, then we apply the normal sale or exchange rules under section 1001 transaction. Amount realized minus adjusted basis, and that gives us capital gain, capital loss. So the normal transaction rules. But if no, if it's not a complete termination, we continue. And that's when we get to this. So in our situation with Apple, well, Apple still owns 20 shares of common stock. Yes, Apple disposes of the two shares of preferred, but Apple still owns the 20 20 shares of common. So therefore, question two is no for Apple. So we continue. All right, question three. Is the section 306 stock, which Apple has, being disposed of by sale or other disposition to a taxpayer other than the corporation? So this is basically to distinguish sales or other dispositions versus redemptions. So question three deals with sales sales or exchanges or dispositions versus question four deals with redemptions. So we're going to see that question three deals with sales or exchanges, question four redemptions. You're going to see there's different tax consequences. So here, Apple has a sale trying to sell two shares three years later to FIG, to FIG, okay? So we have this here, okay? This is section 306 stock being disposed of by sale or or other disposition to a taxpayer other than the corporation that issued the stock. If yes, like we have here for Apple, we compute the amount of taint on the stock, okay? So the amount of taint, this is important, very important. It's the amount that would have been a dividend, okay, had cash been distributed instead of stock. So it's basically, we treat it as what we call the cash substitution test. We basically say, hey, rather than, than at the date of distribution that Apple received, okay, What's going to happen is, so rather than receiving stock by Apple at this date, we're going to receive cash, okay? We're going to receive cash on this specific date, okay? So rather than than receive stock, Apple, we're going to treat as cash substitution, and Apple is going to receive cash rather than stock. Now, this requires considering earnings and profits, and this is very important, for the year 
in which the stock was distributed, not the year that the um, of the sale. So notice in this problem, right, we have the uh, distribution, the stock distribution occurring here, and then three years later, the sale. So we're looking at the earnings and profits at the year of the stock distribution, not the year of sale. Very important. That makes a big difference because a corporation might, that might change. So we look at earnings and profits on that specific year, on the year of the stock distribution. We call that the, the cash substitution test. Note that if there's no earnings and profits during the year, then section 306 does not apply. Very important. You're going to see that echoed throughout. I have that mentioned as well because I wanted to highlight. I have it mentioned here as well. Okay. So if there's not any EMP, then guess what? Section 306 stock, this would not be treated as that. And we just apply the normal rules, the normal sale or exchange rules. Okay. The sales proceeds up to the amount of the taint are includable as ordinary income. So up to the taint are included as ordinary income. Now, if the shareholder is an individual, that amount can qualify, this is very important, for the qualified dividends rates, if applicable, okay, if um, they actually meet the qualified dividend element. But if the shareholder is a corporation, this is very important, this amount does not qualify as a dividend for DRD, dividend receipt deduction purposes. Very important. So basically what it's saying is that the taint up to the amount of the taint is viewed as ordinary income as if it was a dividend, but you have to com- you have to contrast. If it's an individual, you can get the qualified dividend rates, okay, which is the time of the video, the highest qualified dividend rate is 20%, but if it's a corporation, it's not treated as a dividend for purposes of dividend receipt deduction. Big difference. Any remaining amount of sales proceeds, reduced basis, kind of like a return of capital concept, And then finally, beyond basis, we're going to have capital gain distribution. So basically, we apply the three-part waterfall, but we're we're applying it as if we're this taint amount, okay? We're calculating the taint amount. So it's like our section 301 distribution waterfall, but not exactly the same because what we're doing is we are calculating taint as if we're doing it, viewing at the EMP that year, all right? And then what we're doing is, any amount beyond the sales proceeds, the taint is going to be viewed as um, return of capital. And then anything beyond that is going to be capital gain distribution. Okay. So anything beyond the sales proceeds viewed as return of capital. And then anything beyond that capital gain distribution, capital gain distribution, very important. So similar to the three-part waterfall on 301, the distribution rules, but not identical. And again, as I mentioned, if we have out if we don't have any EMP, then this is not going to apply. It's just going to be amount realized minus adjusted basis equals capital gain or capital loss, the normal section 1001 treatment, okay? Because again, you're not fooling anybody. So let's consider an example. This is a different example, but it gives us an idea. So in its only distribution of the year, Barry Incorporated, that's the name of the corporation, distributes 100 shares of preferred stock to each of its common shareholders, blue and red, each of whom have um, owned half the shares of common stock. So under our normal tests for Uh, corporate stock distributions, guess what? There's no uh, taxable event because they're both common stock owners and this is a a pro rata preferred stock dividend um, distribution. So guess what? No tax in the year of the receipt of the preferred shares. So each 100 share distribution um, is worth $5,000, $50 per share for a total distribution of $10,000. Again, because they get, um, it's broken up. Okay, 100 shares of preferred stock to each. All right. The corporation has no accumulated earnings and profits, okay? But it has current earnings and profits of $6,000, which you see, okay, we have this amount, we have 6,000, so we have adequate earnings and profits. The preferred stock constitutes Section 306 stock, as I mentioned, because it's not common stock and it was received tax-free at the date. And Barry Inc. had earnings and profits at the time of distribution. So that makes it Section 306 stock. Had cash of $10,000 been distributed, we would have $5,000 each shareholder, 6,000 of it, 3,000 each shareholder would have been a dividend. And then the remaining poor would be return of capital and capital gain, right? As we've determined already. So here, each share, again, we would have return of capital and capital gain um, and dividend if it was a cash distribution, the cash substitution test, right? But that's not 100% how we calculate, just so you know. So um, each share has a $30 taint, just so you know, of the 50, because that's a $6,000. That's how we calculate if it was cash at that time, okay? So again, each share has a value of $50, 
right? $30 of each share would be tainted because 6,000, right? 6,000 times, I'm sorry, my apologies. $6,000 of EMP, we do $3,000 each owner. There's 100 shares per owner. So each has a $30 taint, $30 of taint. The basis will be determined upon receipt of section 307, which we saw that back in the uh, stock distribution checklist. So let's assume that Blue's basis in each share, just to make it simple, is $5. If Blue were to sell one of the shares for $30 later on, it would be all ordinary income. All $30 would be ordinary income. All $30 for, um, for of that sale of one share preferred would be ordinary income. That is because upon the sale, the proceeds are ordinary income to the extent of the taint. So basically, the first $30, all is going to be ordinary income. All is going to be ordinary income. Anything beyond 30, that's when you apply the return of capital and capital gain and capital gain distribution. Okay? So um, note also that any unrecovered basis, which here, because... There is a $5 basis in each share no, that the unrecovered basis in these shares are going to be reallocated to the other shares of common stock or other shares of preferred stock that it came from, okay? Um, kind of like we did back in the uh, corporate distribution checklist where we take the $6,000 total distribution, I'm sorry, total basis. We divide that by the 20 common shares and two preferred shares to allocate the new basis per share. So it ends up being different than before amount per share. We do a similar thing to reallocate the basis of here. I'm not going to do that. Just know that idea that it is going to be reallocated. Let, so that was for blue. Let's say that red, red's basis in each share is $3. Okay. If red sells one share preferred stock for $35, well, the taint is the first 30, right? The first 30. And then the next three... The next three are going to be return of capital because that's the basis in the share, right? And then beyond that is going to be $2 of capital gain distribution because beyond, because that reduces the basis in the shares down to zero. And then we have $2 of capital gain and that makes up the 35. So that's how we calculate this. Again, there's a tainted amount there. The taint is as if it would be a distribution on that date. But going forward, it makes it different than 301 because you could sell shares for more than it would have been because the value of the shares can go up. That's why it's kind of like a hybrid approach in a way if you think about it. So it's not perfectly as if it was that date because you're not getting the same value per shares, right? The value per shares were $50. The value per shares could change for the preferred shares. So here they sell it for 35. There's 30 of taint or they could go, or they could go down. They could go down, okay? Just so you know, just so you see. Okay, so that's if we have a sale or other disposition of preferred stock. If we don't, we continue. Okay, so what about if it's redemption? If it's redemption by the corporation, corporations buying back the shares, and we have um, of the preferred shares that are Section 306 stock. If yes, the redemption of preferred stock is treated as a Section 301 distribution. So you're saying, huh? I thought we just did that. Yes, we did that in viewing the taint. We viewed it as that date that date. But remember, we have to also view the end date of when it's sold. But for a distribution, I'm sorry, redemption, we treat it as a section 301 distribution at that date, at that date of that event. Okay. So note that in redemption, the issuing corporation actually distributes property in exchange for stock. Therefore, there's no need to perform a historical cash substitution test like we did in step three above. In other words, the taint amount is irrelevant. All we do is say, okay, the amount received by the shareholder will be a section 301 distribution and we apply as of that date, okay? Now, there are exceptions to this rule, okay? If the redemption is through a partial liquidation or the corporation's liquidating, then we apply the complete liquidations checklist, just so you know, okay? Um, we don't, in a partial liquidation, we apply section 1001. This does not apply. So th in this case, these are some special exceptions, okay, to whether the 301 rules would apply. Now note that if a corporation lacks earnings and profits, just like we saw in step three and other issues, this would not be treated as section 306. So this is a special element again. If you have no EMP, then guess what? It's not going to uh, play, uh, be a factor. So I have an example here to show this and how it works and how you can contrast the examples in uh, step three with step four. So different example, 
Citrus Corporation distributes 100 shares of preferred stock pro rata to its um, two common shareholders, Orange and Grapefruit, each of whom owns half of common shares. So right there, it's non-taxable under Section 305A. Under Section 305A, okay? So under Section 305A, it's not taxable. And we have a non-taxable stock distribution. That's going to be important because remember, the first step is always to view if we have Section 306 stock. Okay, each 100 share distribution is worth $1,000. The corporation has no accumulated earnings and profits. It has current earnings and profits of $6,000 at the day of distribution. Now, the preferred stock is Section 306 stock because, again, it's not taxable when received because Section 305A applies because we have common shareholders receiving either common or preferred shares and pro rata amounts. See the uh, corporate stock distribution checklist if you forgot about that. Okay. And it also has earnings and profits. So we have that element. It has earnings and profits at that time. So that means that it is subject to these rules. Five years later, Orange tenders one preferred share in redemption to Citrus Corporation buys it back. Orange receives $18, the stock's fair market value at that time. Citrus Corporation has $10,000 of accumulated EMP and $2,000 of current EMP in the year of redemption. Assume that, um, Citrus Corporation makes no other distributions that year. Given that Citrus Corporation has lots of EMP, right? As $10,000 of accumulated EMP and $2,000 of current EMP, it's all going to be treated as a dividend. So the key is for step three, for a sale, we look back at the EMP at the date of the sale. But for redemption, uh uh-uh, we look back. I'm sorry, we don't look back. We look at the EMP today. EMP today. So make sure you highlight that element. EMP today is the key. Okay. EMP today is the key. All right. So that means all of it is a, is a dividend. And then of course, if you don't have any sales or redemptions, um, you sad don't, don't have any section 306 issues. You could still have section 306 stock that could continue to be held, but until you have a sale or a redemption, um, by the shareholder, you have no issues. Okay. No issues. All right, so that really sums up the issues of Section 306. Again, remember, Section 306 is meant to uh, prevent anti-abuse, just like we had with um, the uh, the redemption issue of Section 302, whether it should be treated as a Section 301 distribution or a Section 1001 exchange. It's all about people trying to avoid that historically high ordinary income tax rate and get the historically lower um, long-term capital gains rate. Um which that still plays a role here. Of course, there's some elements that are still important for today while well, at the time of this video because the qualified dividend rate is um, is lower than it was. Um, you know, we have special rules. That might change in the future when you're watching this. You might not have qualified dividend rates anymore. So that might not be an element and you might have it like it was back in the 1970s, as I mentioned. So I hope you've enjoyed this video. It's definitely important to go back over these problems and understand the concepts of what are what's going on here.